talking about, but we're live. Okay? Fala com meus amigos. Fala away. Hi. <laughs> okay? Nós estamos esperando meu amigo Phil. Okay? Okay? okay. E nós, nós vamos falar sobre implantes, coisas de dentistas, um, cirurgia, ok? Nós temos que esperar para ele, ok? Hey, all my old friends are here. All right, happy Friday, everybody. Let's get Phil. Come here, Smith. Hey, man. What's up, dude? Here, come meet my, come meet Valco and uh, Kyle. Come here. Get over here, you little animal. <laughs> oh. Valco, what's okay. up, dude? Okay, ciao. Hey, my friends are saying hi to you. He can't hear you because I have AirPods on. Oh, right. I was gonna introduce him to my little guy, but he's playing all shy. <laughs> all right. All right. So let me. Just, I'm just closing my door. Okay. All right. So I'll let I'll let it be known in advance. Like I love it where this came from because this is like largely self-serving. Um, because right after we got off with each other last time. I feel like I had so many other questions. Like we had like, I think it was last time, even though we know each other, I feel like it was like first date. It was like, right. tell me about yourself. This is like- And now you want to meet my family? The nitty, the nitty gritty. Um, yeah. And I know that you had some posts that followed what we did last time where I was like, oh my God, it was like, I'm not alone. Like, cause there's so few people that are on the side of the spectrum. I think we're, we're, we're sort of both onto a lot of the subjects that we were mentioning. So yeah. I want to get your opinion on it because I'm challenged consistently with a lot of the stuff we were discussing from hygiene to, uh, you know, whether you should scale, whether you should probe, whether you should floss. And I love that you guys are actually, I know you're putting some research to some of this stuff, mm -hmm. which I had picked your brain on a while back. I'd ask you and Tom to send me stuff because I, I do like a half day course on so like soft tissue ma maintenance and kind of maintenance around dental implants. And I get a lot of backlash consistently from hygienists, other periodontists in the community, et cetera. Yeah. And I think that, um, so I guess those are some of the questions I want to go to. Plus I want to learn about your stuff with the on one and yeah. all that stuff, because I think that that's kind of huge. So I don't know if you're like a set way. I've even pulled up my computer behind here because there's some stuff like I want to ask you and show and, and whatever else as we go along. But um, I don't know if you want to do this a genius. I love there it. We go. How did you do that? Um, on the bottom right, there's a little place where you can. I saw someone else do it last week. That was my first time, so I'm glad that it oh, it this worked is super out. Slick. Yeah. What did you What did you do? You flipped the screen. So I saved it as a photo, and then just you select it on the bottom right, and you can put it up there. That's incredible. I love it. Um, yeah. So we can start talking about floss. Yeah. And I, I would put probing in the same. 100%. In the same part of this, okay? So I put up a study the other day that was showing that maybe floss um, can cause some problems in implants mm -hmm. because it can leave remnants. And there were a lot of people <laughs> pretty angry and trying to quote a lot of, um, a lot of research on this yep. as, as to why I was wrong. And I want to be very very distinct in this in that I think so much research that is out there doesn't have the correct inclusion and exclusion criteria and it also doesn't no. mention the um, study design as much okay so like like Thomas said and I think he commented Thomas Lankavicious is who we're talking about um, he commented on my post is that most traditional research is based off of ceramic metal type of restorations on implants. So this means ceramic going all the way down to the implant neck, basically. Yeah. Or as, as far down as possible, let's say. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at a lot of research and it, it shows how, you know, this may work or this may work, it's hard to even trust that research because 
we know that there is influence of what material you put subgingibly. Yep. And then in that same, in that same sense, just like when you start learning about vertical tissue thickness, I don't want to change too much, but when you start learning about vertical tissue thickness, you start looking at old research that used to quote and then say, I can't really trust this research anymore because they didn't measure vertical tissue thickness. Yeah, you know, they're looking at some other factor, but they haven't controlled the factors that really matter on implant bone loss. Yeah, so I mean, for me, so I mean, so let's, I'll just straight up phase this, phrase this question to you, which is like a little bit loaded. So yeah, you sort of just answered it, but do you endorse flossing around dental implants? And I think the problem with the question, because I get that whenever I lecture on this topic, uh, you know, and I say that we're going to get into some hard questions and we talk about how, uh, for me, like things are constantly evolving and changing. And probably if you asked me that question or about hygiene or probing around implants, when I first started my residency, when I didn't ask questions, I was just told, you know, by the first person as a blank slate that this is what you do or don't do. And I just accepted it. Maybe I looked at a little bit of the evidence. I was told hygiene, flossing, everything around implants, exactly the same as around teeth. And I was quite strong on that and carried that out of my residency. When I got out of practice, I changed my philosophy little bit by little bit based on some clinical things that I had seen. And I, that's why I love that you have the, you're starting to actually build real evidence or research because most of it was anecdotal or experiences that I'd seen from clumps of patients. Um, and I, I guess everyone asks me in the audience, they just, everyone wants a, a, a yes or a no answer or the magic bullet, right? And they don't appreciate that there's, first of all, everything is case by case. Uh, one of the biggest things that I find with hygiene for me is first of all, flossing isn't just flossing. I mean, I have no problem, and I say this to people, with someone flossing, if they're gonna really, like I say, if you have food caught between your teeth and you wanna floss between your teeth, like the contacts, I'm okay with that. It's when you're getting into the subgingival area that I don't think you should be flossing the same way that you should be flossing around natural teeth. So yeah. there's that. There's also, whether it's a posterior or an anterior, I'm gonna care a lot less in the posterior. If they wanna go around there, I mean, I don't love it, but I'll live with it. I'll have more of a threshold for it than I would around anterior teeth. And then the last piece is, is this implant healthy or is it already a problem? Because if the, the implant has periimplantitis or it has mucositis or it has issues, I don't care nearly as much. Do whatever the hell you want around that implant, right? To get it clean, to get it back to health. But if it's pristine, and I think that's where a huge piece of the miscommunication comes, that's where I don't want people to be as heavy handed around an implant as they are around a tooth because they just aren't made up of the same construction. And we know that by a yeah. lot, right? Okay, so here's my two distinctions that I wanna give. We'll go, um, we'll do this one first. So there's two distinctions. The first distinction is what material is on the, um, what material is on, oh, am I losing, let me, so I lost it okay, my Wi-Fi is on. I want to put a, okay. Kyle, where, how, do I put a, how do I put a picture up? I don't know if you can. I uh, think only I can because I'm hosting it. Too bad. Okay, yeah. I just wanted to put up the classic image of the distinction between. Oh, tooth and, and implant, I've got, yeah. I've got it here, right up Yeah, we should have planned better for that. That's okay. Um, okay, so two distinctions. First one is, what material is subgingival? Okay, first distinction. Yep. Second distinction is super gingival flossing versus subgingival flossing. Or, you know, let's not even say flossing. Let's say super gingival cleaning versus subgingival cleaning. Then that makes it very easy. So let's talk about the first distinction. What is subgingival? Now, if I've done an implant and I've done it, let's say, in the last, I don't know, three, four years, I don't floss subgingival. I don't probe because my material subgingival is polished titanium or polished zirconium. Yeah. Therefore, that means we know from the research that I can get attachment to this material. And although it's not attachment like it is on cementum, um, it's the best that we can get on an implant. And by going in and probing that, or by going in and flossing that, or by going in and using um, a go-between on that or anything, a Christmas tree, anything that's going subgingival, I'm breaking that attachment and I'm causing a pocket. So what happens on teeth, your periodontist, what happens on teeth that have pockets? 
Yeah, I mean, there's loss of the attachment. I mean, we lose thing, bone. Yeah. yeah. And what on implants, what's interesting is so many times attachment loss on implants is caused by doctors not knowing, right? Whether it's materials or probing or whatever. And then we say, oh, well, you know, every implant loses bone to the first thread. And we know that that's not true anymore. Yeah, I mean, there's like, I, I think so, you know, I think that, that it's tolerable. Um, that may be like somewhere where I do or don't difference from Tom, I don't know, like, and, and you guys were, and I don't think it's holding myself to a lower standard, but I just appreciate that we do all these things that you guys mentioned in the zero bone loss concepts or all these things we're discussing you know, every one of these details are just going to increase the chance of a successful outcome. Exactly so right. Guarantee it. And you just want to, you want to minimize or mitigate the things that are going to cause these things. Now, if you do all these things and you get a, a, some bone loss to the first thread, which can happen or bone loss, I mean, it happens to the best of us, right? So yeah. I think that's important to appreciate. Yep. You, you, I mean, you had my mind going in so many things. I like that division of what you mentioned because I have a slide where I put up um, people asking about all of the various hygiene mechanisms. So usually I get asked, can I floss? Can I brush? I mean, brushing goes without saying, I don't think anyone's gonna argue that, that's a given. Um, people ask about water picks. Yep. People ask me about um, like any type of pokers or prodders or stimulants or things like that. Um, I get asked about, um, what else do I get asked about cleaning wise? Like super flosses and different things. I mean, all sorts yeah. of instruments. And then on the hygiene, like professional side of things, I get asked about scalers. So I, I mean, for me, so I guess I, I'm in agreement with you. And I think that a lot of this circulates, as we know, that for the most part, even with the, even with the um, materials that you're mentioning, that there is a distinction between obviously a true connective tissue fiber attachment, so-called Sharpies fibers, right? literally perpendicularly going into yeah. cementum of a root. And mm -hmm what everyone has dubbed something different to a paramucosal seal. And, you know, if you want to call it like, we'll get to this later, but Nobel's muco integration or everyone's trying to, yeah. other companies, Bio Horizons has created their laser lock, which for a period of time did show some histologic evidence, which is the only way to see that. But most people, I don't know if they appreciate that really what you're seeing is this so-called hemidesmosomal weakest attachment in the body type of resting against and i've heard people use the analogies of you know the elasticized end of a ski jacket or yeah wadwani says that yeah exactly mm -hmm. chan chander mm -hmm. is obviously a huge champion of this and that's why I, when i put up all these images you know your mind is going like mine to the cement and screw discussion to all, all these things are really interwoven um so let's go through just the hygiene on the home care side of things maybe okay. let's go through and then we can get both of our opinions so do you permit or recommend or when patients pose the question to you, would you clean around an implant? Would you, we just discussed, I guess, flossing, brushing we say is okay. How about things like water picks, for instance, at home? Yeah, you know, that's hard. I do recommend it, but I don't know if we have good evidence on it. Yeah, so I'm, I'm for possibly just for being like biased the same way that I don't like the idea of anything that disrupts the attack that I worked so hard to create. Yeah. I tell them, no, the only place that we use them in a huge fashion is around all on force. Full arch, like yeah. We, we give patients it when we yeah. do them because if we don't, we know they, they won't, won't buy it. it. Yeah. The way to maintain it. Yeah. But so, so that's kind of my thing. If, a, again, and the, probably the biggest distinction that I make for patients and for people that I'm, I'm, I'm discussing this with as colleagues is the health versus disease. And I often say that when teeth and implants are healthy, we don't treat them the same. Like an, a healthy implant should not be treated like a tooth. Don't fool around with it. But when an implant becomes diseased, then the, it actually becomes closer. We start doing things like closed approach scaling like teeth. at first. Right, exactly. They become mm -hmm. similar to teeth, even to the point that, frankly, I mean, it's not sexy, but doing things like a pocket elimination and doing a threadectomy will, will solve your problems around a molar implant if a person is adamant to save it. Right. Well, it, it, it'll stop it from getting worse. Sorry, that's right? what I'm saying. So, yeah. right, which is, again, an older school approach you do in, in true perio. Yeah. This, I wouldn't ever recommend these things around a healthy implant, but if it becomes disease and it, the question changes, I think it's reasonable to consider those things. Yeah. Um, and what do you, I don't know, do you, do you have, you're, you're in a general practice, so do you have a hygiene practice there? We do. Mm -hmm. So what do you tell your hygienists in terms of, scalers probes and then 
obviously there's the metal plastic debate, which is a yep. huge one. And there's the, uh, you know, everything in between the graphites and the titaniums and the carbons and things like that. Yeah. So I tell my, I tell my hygienists don't probe around implants yep. at all. Um, I tell them scale super gingerly. I allow yep. them to go one millimeter subgingival basically into the sulcus. And this is that distinction. If, if anybody's read zero bone loss concepts is between the plaque zone and the adherence zone. Because if you have adherence, all you're gonna do by scaling is break that adherence and cause a pocket. Educate all me you're on gonna that, do by that's probing. something, educate me on this plaque versus adherence because I have a vague familiarity with it. I think it's an important topic. And yeah. I actually, when I saw Tom speak in Boston at the Classics meeting, I actually think I sent you the screenshot and I asked you, can you think you can get this thing for me? It's that one where he takes <laughs> where off. Where he twists it off. Yes, yeah, I yeah. love that imagery. And he showed it again on Thursday, actually. Yeah, and, he shows it all the uh, time. Yeah, so that that's supposed to define it, right? Like where there's some form of epithelial attachment to a portion of it. Right. Uh, not fibroblast, but true epithelial attachment. Epithelial attachment, yeah. yeah. Not fibroblast. Yeah, because fibroblast is going to be like the first, you know, half a millimeter, maybe, you know, where, where there's there's connected tissue there, right? And then everything above that is really epithelial until you get to the sulcus. And in the sulcus is where you'll have plaque. That's the plaque zone. Anywhere below that is where you're going to have epithelial attachment and that's yeah. the adherence zone. And again, we have to make that distinction. It's the adherence zone only if you have a material that you can adhere to. Sure. So and if you have well, zirconia, polished zirconia, correct? Polished zirconia, yeah, or titanium, but it's better with polished with polish zirconia. So if you have a zirconia abutment, but they glazed it all the way down, you don't have an adherence zone. If right. you have um, porcelain going all the way down, you know, you don't have an adherence zone. So yeah, I guess there's three distinctions now we, we've, we've come up with, right? So we've got super gingival versus sub gingival cleaning. Yes. In that sub gingival, we even have another distinction, which is plaque zone versus adherence zone. Yeah. And then what was the other distinction that I had? Oh, material. So plaque zone is, is the most coronal aspect, correct? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And then anything yeah. sub gingival is considered adherence zone or where's the division between the two? Yeah. If you have the correct material. But yeah. 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 Exactly right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, and so, so for, like, for yeah, example, ahead, on, on one of my, on one of my last posts, someone was referencing an article that said that, um, if you veneered porcelain on an abutment sub gingival, it had the same uh, bone loss. I have to pull it up. It had the same, let me, let me find what it said. Submucosal veneering of zirconia abutments did not negatively affect the health of the peri-implant tissues. So you had, let's say you had one that had zirconia. They didn't say if it was polished or yeah. one that had veneering porcelain. And they said on the research, they performed the same, right? The, the probing depths were the same. The, the bleeding was the same. The bone loss was the same. And when you read conclusions, that sounds like, ah, okay, well, then I can just veneer my abutments, right? Just make it look pretty subgingival or whatever I need to do. Yeah. But then when you look into the study, and this is why it's important to actually read the articles, they did not define, and I'm bringing up my notes, they didn't define what screw retained restorations look like. They didn't define where glaze went, if zirconia was polished. And then when you think about it, let's say they did define that, right? And they even had polished zirconia, perfect subgingival in the one class. And in the other class, they had the veneered abutments. What they do is like every three months, they go through and probe them yeah. to see how it is. So yeah. even if you did have that attachment, now you don't have that attachment. And they also took subgingival um, uh, plaque. They like put paper points down there to get subgingival plaque. So if they didn't ruin the attachment with the probe, they sure as hell did when they jammed a bunch of paper points in there. So no wonder in this research, it says that it behaved the same because you caused a pocket on the ones that may have had adherence. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm totally with you. So like when people ask me the division between whether they should scale or not or probe or not, and then the next question is always whether or not, if you're gonna, if the answer is yes, then will you use plastic or metal? Mm -hmm. So, you know, historically this whole plastic thing came twofold. One was to be potentially less damaging to the attachment. And the second was you weren't gonna scratch the surface of some of these things. Right. There's lots of 
there's lots of literature showing that the amount of scratching that a metal instrument will do even on a polished surface will have a limited of like it does negligible effect on what the epithelial or the fibroblastic adherence will be mm -hmm. but so for me i always tell people if it's healthy and this is what i tell my hygienist and the hygienist that i work with and the dentist if it's healthy again i always talk about looking with your eyes people are like well how am i supposed to know if there's a problem well do you see any inflammation? Is it red? Is the implant mobile? Is there recession? Is there suppuration? Is there symptoms? Is there radiographic bone loss? We have all of these other things at our disposal. First, if you notice any of those things and you need further kind of investigation, that's a different discussion. But again, you don't want to continue breaking this attachment. And this will somewhat segue you know, into the on one idea and not taking things on and off all the time but you don't want to break the attachment consistently. So for me, I tell them, I joke, I say, you know, I know the way hygienists and dentists are, they can't control their hands. So I was like, if you feel like you literally cannot control yourself, I'd rather you probably take a plastic instrument, a probe, because it's, it is like, you know, less vigorous. And from a scaling standpoint, I often joke that I find that plastic scalers are, well, they're like Fisher Price. They're like, if you've ever tried using one of these things, actually, yeah, they, do suck. I, I, they, they don't do anything. They're so flexible and they're large. So they're really cumbersome to actually get. So that they don't break, type, right? right? Right. And so they, yeah. to get in this deep, like to get into a pocket or to get into the attached area, you're going to rip it to shreds. So I would rather them not do anything. If again, things become diseased, it's a different situation. Um, I, and if I go into the disease element of things, I'd rather than be using like Brassler has and Euphrates has good, like titanium or graphite or carbon or different ones that are at least a little bit more vigorous and could potentially remove something or do something while still not scratching in case you think that that kind of matters. So that's yeah. kind of my mantra with that. Um, I ultrasonic wise, I'm against ultrasonic. Um, there's these like single use tips that you can put on them. And I had a colleague um, from Tufts who uh, was like the second in command, kind of the perio program. And he was asked to use one of these items and he sent me the picture and he said he used it like sub gingively aggressively around an implant with periimplantitis. And it's made of like silicone or something and it got devoured. And he mm. ended up having to raise a flap. And he's got this picture of this thing like gnarled like and he was impregnated out into the pieces the, uh, from, like, from raising the flap to get out. So he's like, I would never touch this thing again. But yeah. he said, I would recommend it if you want to use it superficially, then great. But you know, the last thing that I said to you was I was recently lecturing and some, you know, older dentist put his hand up and I thought, here comes a question that's going to be like a low blow. And he goes, you know what? He goes, I never, I normally I would have argued with most of what you're saying. He goes, but I'm just thinking in my head, he goes, I can't even think of the last time that I saw an abundance of plaque or calculus build up on like a porcelain restoration. He's like, they're polished. He's like, you don't see it like the tartar people get on the, on the lingual of a, of their mandibular and anter like anteriors mm -hmm. or something. And I was like, you're right. You're right. You really don't get that huge amount of plaque build up. It's not the same circumstance. Yeah. So we actually had a question from Howie Gluckman, which is awesome oh, that he's even watching true. this. So Howie said, My why do you think- frozen. My thing's frozen. Oh, really? I have, okay. I have so a I'll tell you. story for Howie that I'll have to tell him on a side I'll tell you. Why do you think the tissue won't heal and will rather form a pocket after probing? So that's a great question. I think that it, like probing once may, it, or twice, let's say, may um, heal. Just like how, you know, we can have times where we take off an abutment, put it back on once or twice. But if we do it 10 times, then I think we start to form... I don't know. I don't, I don't have the proper term, but almost like a scar, like the yeah. body says, okay, this is, this is my new, Hey, Hey, Howie, this is uh, this is my new normal. And then I feel like, and again, this is not research based. This is all opinion based yeah. is that I feel like a new biologic width will form starting at that point. Also, I think that with the probing, we can introduce some plaque, but I'll have to, I'll have to text Howie and see what he, what he says on this too. Yeah, so for, for me, and I know that there's actually somewhat recent literature, I think Dennis Tarnow, um, he, he was of the mindset of what Howie said, which is that actually, and I don't know if Howie was kind of answering his own question. That, Howie said he agrees with not probing, which is nice. Oh, okay. So, yeah, but there, so he's are, on our there, side. <laughs> there, there, is a, there, there is a camp um, that says that it will reattach. And again, I think it just goes to 
look at all these things we look at the efforts that we go to from provisionalization to the intricacies that we're talking about screw versus cement retention surfacing on different implants right it's just why are we will will some people and then we could get into a whole discussion on phenotype and thickness and autoimmunity and like you know some people don't even have to brush their teeth and they don't even get inflammation so it's yeah. it's we're just again i think trying to mitigate things um but uh I, the, what landed for us with the hygienist was we had by chance, and this is so not how he said, how he said, there's a great article by Hugo de Braun on this topic in Perio 2000. Yeah, yeah. Send me the article, Howie, please send it yeah. to me. <laughs> yeah. And you know, and, and, and to, you know what, uh, Tom had asked me about this when I mentioned to you, you know, the, the recent classification, speaking of like more hardcore Perio, by yeah, the, this is the great, European by the way, Federation of Perio. And um, in conjunction and, uh, with the American Academy of yes, Perio. Yes, correct. Yeah. So they basically redid the classification system. Everyone hates it. No one cares really about it. You only use it if you're in academia. But I was forced to learn it because a bunch of study clubs were asking me to lecture on it. So I said, I better just get this kind of over with. It's not as bad as I thought on the surface. But one thing that struck me was in their discussion of peri implant health, peri implant mucositis, and peri implantitis, this, they don't suggest you should not probe because they still have an element of it in there but right. one thing they said was that you no no longer can you determine implant health based on or disease based on a certain probing depth and i mean for me this was something that was like thank god they finally published this dennis and others have talked about this i've seen lectures if we're told to place an implant again everyone has their rules and their different ways of doing it everyone wants to know let's say you do two to three three to four millimeters deep because yeah. there's need emergence profile running room. I'm not going to get into semantics, but if you, that, mm -hmm. right, if you do that, and that's in the anterior, let's say, well, okay, that's in the, the anterior. And that's going to be from like the, uh, we normally say maybe, or a few millimeters um, apical to the adjacent CJs of the tooth. So the CJ is a few millimeters down on the buckle in a healthy tooth. Now you're a few millimeters, you're six millimeters down. But how about at the interproximal, where an average papilla is three, four, or five millimeters? If you're measuring from the papilla downwards, you're seven, eight, nine millimeters <laughs> in a healthy in a healthy situation to get good yeah. emergence. And so they they retracted that and said that you can't really use um, you can't really use the the probing depth to determine whether an implant is healthy. Because I have tons of referrals writing me when patients change, saying your implant is seven has a seven millimeter probing. Well, it probably had. Where's the delta? And a super it, highly scalloped gingival phenotype, seven, right? It had gingival seven architecture. from the day I placed it, right? So, yeah. um, but definitely I'll, I'll check out kind of how he's thinking. What happened for us that really changed my mind on this was- How he said he's going to send it to me too. So yeah, I'll, uh, and, I'll share it with you. Yeah. And um, the, the thing that changed my mind is we had a group, you know, sometimes you get patients who around implants, maybe no one likes to admit to it. Sometimes you get little pinpoint fistulas or pockets it can happen, I find, more easily around implants than natural teeth. And sometimes just throwing an antibiotic at it as a first line of conservative gets rid of it because their attachment, again, is so fickle, being had me as mesomal and, anything, and everything. Mm -hmm. So I actually, what happened to us was we had in like the same day or a few days, a cluster of patients who came in with these like pinpoint fistulas or deep pockets or areas that, that dentists were, had sent us. And we asked all of them their recent history it had just so happened that the stars aligned that all these patients said, I just had like a scaling done at my hygienist <laughs> within the week. Interesting. And we exactly. And we just said, listen, this is not a randomized control trial, but like right. what, what we said was our thought was, and back to Howie's point about, did you probe and will it reattach? Well, maybe it will reattach after they scaled the hell out of it, but maybe within that three, four days subsequent, they actually, Something got food, got crap, got yeah. whatever. It created the pocket. And in the time the body needed to re-adhere or reattach or whatever terminology you want to use, it unfortunately had caused damage. And it, it did heal. It did heal. We put them on antibiotics, you know, some chlorhexidine, whatever you want to do. We didn't do it. You don't get crazy around an implant right away. Yeah. So that's, I think, kind of my, that's my uh, hygiene or maintenance in a, in a, in a nutshell. In yeah, sense. I'm, um, I'm going to hopefully be doing some research on water picking and the pressure of water pick that's used that will yeah. actually detach epithelial yeah. attachment to polished zirconia so that we can get some better kind of clinical research on that. But for right now, you know, we don't really know. That's great. You okay, so I think, yeah, let's so, so let's move on a little bit. So yeah. I think 
to summarize that topic, I would say, do anything super gingival. Do anything you want. Yes. Brush, floss, yes. water pick, yes. interproximals, yes. anything. Don't do anything sub -gingival. If you have, or if you suspect you have attachment to a clean biological material, if you don't, so let's say you do have an older case that you did, or maybe you just learned this topic today and the case you put on two months ago is ceramic all the way down to the implant neck. Yes, floss subgingivally. Yes. So all ceramic metal restorations that go down to the down subgingivally, you need to floss. Yeah. So I think that was taken out of context when I did that post is like, oh, you shouldn't floss at all around implants. And I did kind of post it like that so that to like get people to think about it a little bit. Yeah, we have to make and that. And you saw Kelly this morning. He's like, just to be provocative, just to be provocative. Right? <laughs> just take out the lateral. <laughs> exactly. But yeah. and, and and I agree. You you'd be surprised. I like. I sorry. Just before we move, I got to just read you this email because this came from a like a colleague and friend. So after I gave a lecture to a group of hygienists, I get an email. This goes back like four or five years ago, and. Uh, I, this guy's kind of like a friend and colleague. He says, hey, Phil, quick question for you. Subject was implant maintenance. He says, a hygienist asked me about implant maintenance. She, show, she told me she saw you lecturing. I just lost you. I can't. Oh, there you are. I can't hear you. My nutshell or long, long thing was I said, I said, that's not, I said, that's not what we tell them. I said, there is some truth to what she's mentioning, but she's taking it out of context. And, you know, people unfortunately do that. And I went on to just basically say exactly what you mentioned, which is you need to have these, this case specificity. So I think, Okay. Apparently it wasn't just me, Phil. We lost yeah. you as soon as you started talking about the email. Uh, so just give us a, now? give us a, give us a, yeah, we can hear you now. Just give us a, um, a recap of the email. Yeah, basically, the, the, the guy wrote me just saying, are you telling hygienists? Because one of my hygienists, uh, I, I, yeah, I just got, I'm getting text flying in now saying lost your audio. Yeah. <laughs> um, I haven't actually, unfortunately, I've lost, I don't know when I like sent myself an image. I can't see any questions or any who's in on the room. Oh, weird. Yeah, okay. so unfortunately, I can't say hi to people or whatever, but. Um, yeah, so I guess, you know, as let's say as educators, we need to be careful of saying, Kind of what I was saying, those distinctions. And maybe we should create like a chart that says like super gingival, sub gingival we're gonna materials. Have a longer talk. We're going to have a longer yeah. talk after this. And because um, we do run the risk of getting people to uh, say, oh, well, I heard that Kyle and Phil said you shouldn't uh, clean around implants, you know? You know what? And, and again, I, it's fine. It, you know, it steers attention and you know, there's, oh, that, there's that old, like, no such thing as bad publicity. So it's fine. It fills the room in some sometimes. But anyways, all right. So let's go on to, do you want to, what do you want to discuss next? I think we should go off of or? that to one abutment one time. Let's do it. Okay. So going off of this idea that if we can get attachment to clean biological materials, then we don't want to get attachment, rip it, try to get attachment again, rip it, try to get attachment again, rip it. And yes. so um, I first saw the original kind of one abutment one time coming from a lot of colleagues in Europe. So yeah. like, um, Inaki or Marcus Blass was doing it a lot. Uh, Francesco yeah. Mitroni. And I think it, uh, our European colleagues were doing that first. And that was actually doing a prefab. I shouldn't say pre prefabricated custom. Yeah. Customized prefabricated abutments that they take out, whether at uncovering or at implant placement, they put on the final abutment. Oftentimes they'll do that. Yeah, Stavros does it too. They'll do it super gingivally and then prep it down. And I did a lot of cases like this with Sasha Jovanovic. I think because of his European influence, he asked me to do this on cases yeah. we were doing together. And we did get, get, nice, um, get nice bone levels and tissue because we were only putting something in once, we were cleaning it before we put it in and then we didn't touch it. Now the problem with that is that in a lot of those cases we had cement and in the anterior region, which is mostly where we were doing this, our cement margins were too deep. And the other problem was that kind of from a restorative standpoint, our hands caught stuff behind our back a little bit. 
we had to accept the emergence profile. We had to accept wherever the margins were. And that, that was difficult. So I think when this stay in abutment came into play, you know, a few years ago, with a few different companies for me, as, because I do, I, I do the surgical and the restorative side. I loved this and yeah. there's positives and negatives to it. What are your thoughts? So you know, again, I have actually admittedly, like, you know, I, I, I work with a few different implant companies and one of them is Nobel BioCare. And I obviously, they, they kind of inundated me anytime they have a new product, you know, they come to their people and say, you know, give this a whirl, give us an honest thing. I never ended up, never ended up using it. Um, uh, there's a few reasons. So one thing that never, it, it makes sense to me superficially, but I guess, is it supposed to represent a best of both worlds? Cause are we not just going back to a tissue level implant in some respects? Like why wouldn't well, I just use like a polished color, a polished color implant? That's yeah, what yeah, I yeah. understand. So that's a great right? question. Like, so it's like, so, so, I think so it, please enlighten me on that because that's from, what came good. up in our, in the breakout sessions at the last KOL meeting. Yeah. And I just, I didn't know, I, I couldn't get past that. Now, I'm going to say that I'm guessing most of the people that said, why don't we just use a tissue level implant are only surgeons. And I think it's because right. Maybe. I'm just a surgeon. surgeons I'm a surgeon. don't sure. have to deal with the restorative aspect. And from a surgical standpoint, tissue level implant is pretty good. And the reason why I would say it's pretty good is because if you know, you know do some of the kind of zero bone loss concept stuff like... Um, do... It's amazing. It moves. Listen, it's better than a platform shift. It moves the micro gap completely away from the bone level, right? So yeah, yeah. I mean, great... One piece implant. One piece. One piece implant is great if you get primary stability. If you don't have to do a two stage surgery. If you don't have this? to do bone grafting around it. If you don't have to do tissue grafting around it. If yeah, you I mean, place it perfectly prosthetically. Exactly. The the one yeah. piece implant, if it's done correctly, is fantastic, right? <laughs> yeah. The problem is, I think, from a restorative standpoint, and yeah. you know, again, stage, what are you going to do? But also, if you lose bone, if you lose tissue on the one piece implant, what do you do? You can't. In this case, yeah. what you can still do is always go back to bone level. I think that's one of the big things. So you have sort of flexibility in the sense that you can, can still. Um, you can do screw retain, you can do cement retain, whatever you want. You can use whatever you want. You're bringing, you're still gonna have a micro gap at the implant level, but it's gonna be very small. And it's going to bring any bigger micro gaps above the bone. And yeah. so I think with this, you have a good biological standpoint and you have a restorative standpoint. And saying there, there's not, um, there's not good research on this. If you can make sure the 3D perfect, that's for the tissue level. Um, there is research, um, you know, multi, multi center research, and I can bring it up on one abutment, one time concept, having better tissue and bone level. But then you also have to think looking at that research, did they look at tissue thickness in the first in the first point, because we know from Thomas's research that that's so important. So that's hard yeah. when you go back and look at that, because there, there's a lot of a lot of one abutment, one time research that that supports. And I'm looking forward to my lecture right now that yeah. supports why we should use that. Oh, here we go. OK, so we've got um, seven controlled clinical clinical trials. Abutment disconnection and reconnection significantly affected peri-implant marginal bone levels. So that's taking it in and out, in and out, in and out. Well, I mean, that um, goes back, what's the classic one from a million years ago, Abraham or, or whatever. They yeah. took you say, even a healing abutment on and off a, a bunch of times. I don't know if it was a dog study. I forget, right. but I remember that, that was my literature. That, they were like, that testing platform switching and non-platform platform switching. Yeah. You may be able to take it off more, but even with one disconnection on platform switching have you just froze Kyle you just froze okay you're back now you just froze on me for a sec there
Oh, and Kyle, I just lost your audio. I don't know if you can hear me. I just, I'm, I've lost your audio, pal. Got nothing. Let's see. I hope you guys can hear me now. I went uh, wired, so I hope this works. We'll get Phil back on here. All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming back. Can you guys give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Good now. Oh, okay, good. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to post this again. And let's, let's pin this comment. Let's get Phil back on here. Good. Okay. All okay, right. Phil, hey, yeah, sorry. As well, in case, in case it was signed with my connection, I don't know. Yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't know what happened. Okay, so where did you lose me? Because I was I blabbing for a long time. The literature. You were talking about the literature. That's where I lost you. Okay, so... We do have some research showing that when you disc things less, you're gonna get better stable bone and tissue. The problem with some of the research, and I would say most of the research, is that it doesn't take into account tissue thickness. And we know that if you have a thin tissue biotype, you're more likely to lose bone no matter what, no matter how many times you disconnect it. Right. Um, and and Lincoln Vicious did these studies. So, it's hard to say. I think from a biologic standpoint and from a restorative standpoint, I, I really like this concept from any company that's bringing it in because I think from a referral standpoint too, most general dentists, most restorative doctors, let's say, they don't want to go down to the bone level. And, you know, my dad's like this. My dad always said, yeah. like, you know, I, that's why I send it to the surgeon so that they deal with the bone and the tissue. I just kind of want to do the top part, you know? And so I think that's from fair. a referral standpoint, that could be really nice as well. You bring it up to, you know, kind of the tissue level away from the bone level. The other thing that I think is really nice for this from a surgeon standpoint in a referral based system is you surgeons don't have to worry about, you know, let's say restorative doctor putting the wrong material down subgingival. That's true. Yeah, I mean, I agree with with all those sentiments. And I, my other, and this may be a, a wrong thing to kind of be like risk thinking wise, but the other thing I didn't love about the on one, and again, this goes with t like concerns with tissue level. And I know everyone wants to have an implant that heals perfectly and is perfect and all that, but I always had this concern about possible added show through of a polished collar of a piece like that. And now you're getting again into the tissue thickness discussion, but more so just like if I had even a little bit of recession. So would you use something like an on one across the board or do you think it's more tailored for posterior and premolars and things like that? Or is it good in the anterior where again, you're managing the tissue, but now I would never put a tissue level implant in the, in the anterior any longer, yeah. right? So what, what are your thoughts on its indication? Is it better in one part of the mouth than in another? Or yeah, I think, I think that I'm going to, I'm going to bring up some cases to show you, but I think, for no bells, at least for no bells on one, it's a yeah. posterior solution. Right. Now that's different because MIS's connect abutment is a little thinner 
yeah and um i think allows you to use it in the anterior and a lot of colleagues are using it in the anterior like for example um when sasha and i were doing some on one cases i think when it first came here we pushed the limit so let me see if i can show you this so this is four four anterior seats, four anterior implants with four on ones. Wow. And I mean, I would get, we could have a whole other argument about this in terms of the number of implants placed there, but I won't go there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, this, is, this I'm, was I'm patient, huge, huge, this was I'm patient driven. And, and that's, that's the, and again, I have a whole lecture and piece and we all could talk, uh, Sean bomb. And, and, you know, I, I think most go laterals on that with a four unit, but yes, oh, yeah, only for time sure. four, four singles is a patient driven. I want single entities. Uh, this I agree. That's exactly with right. This is exactly yeah. right. And you know, I, yeah. I did this case with Sasha and you know, if anybody knows that he knows that. <laughs> so this yeah. case was extraction, immediate placement of four, um, Bone grafting with tissue grafting, yeah. and then on one place at uncovery. But that was like we were just trying to so, let's see that, what we can do to yeah, push. I was going to say, in. why would you? So, what would be the reason for placing it on uncovery? Because that's like isn't the whole another whole piece of the utility that I think they 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 add to is um, is the fact that you don't have to take things on and off as much as the convenience perspective. I think there's some people I know uh, even I think. Bobby Birdie had like recently did. It's just one case, but he went straight to final using one of those things, right? And yeah, for uh, sure. Yeah. No, so it depends. It's all about once you have the involvement with the bacteria and the biologic with this form, that's when you want to put it in. So that's yeah. either. Oh, well, we got a thumbs up. From, got a thumbs up from DDI. Now that I said Bobby Birdie, right? Of course. <laughs> Who's on the other side of that? That's a good question. Exactly. <laughs> It's Saj, it's, it's Birdie. Um, yeah, Bobby, I want to check. Put in the so mail. <laughs> it's, it's, when, it's when the implant is exposed to the mouth and the biologic width form. So when we have an implant that has tissue over it in, in two stage, right? It's a very the biologic width the biologic hasn't width, formed yet. You're right. It always forms after the second stage. So, it's, in, so it's when you're forming the biologic width is when we want to attach this one above at one time. And whether that is a customized one or whether it's one of these prefabricated and what i like to say to to explain this to prosthodontists and things is it's like a single tooth multi-unit abutment which makes no sense it's the multi-unit abutment with a hex on it right yeah 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 i get what you're saying so i mean is i guess in reality when it comes to the pros and cons is this something that you're you were using routinely are using routinely case by case what drives you to physically use it because i mean i'd like to kind of use it one thing that keeps us from using it is as you know a big part of our practice is kind of same day implant care as it is so we have a provisional on there and that provisional usually stays on until the time that till impression like however many months later so yeah um you know it's not the same thing but that that's uh you know, to some degree, if we don't tamper with that, that's our idea. And we kind of leave it there, right or for wrong, for right or for wrong, I don't know. But uh, yeah. I, I, I'm using it in, I try and use it in every posterior case. Yeah. Yeah. And then for I me, actually, it, actually, it, actually Blackburn, she, and I'm pretty sure that's actually Shacked. She'll correct me if I'm wrong, because she's a Nobel rep. I did a lecture with her in Indianapolis. It is, it is in the fact that it has two screws. Um, so two screws. Yeah. I actually think, um, you know, and I use Nobel, I use other systems as well. I think that's a negative. I, I like the idea of it like as you have to piece. screw the on, you have to screw the on one on, and then you have to put like a then screw into the on one with. The, yeah. So with the I, I actually like how um, MIS is, is in that case in the okay. sense that it's one piece. It's like a one piece multi-unit abutment. So you don't right. have a screw channel where bacteria can get involved. And okay. I think it's Todd Schoenbaum who talks about that. And I think even proved that um, you can get bacteria inside the screw channel that can go out around the connection and cause bone loss. So having that, that one abutment one time with a solid abutment, I think is even better. 
v Vinay is asking me if I'm cold. No, I'm not cold. I came inside from running outside with my kids, and there's a there's a a rat. There were so many hair comments. There's a rat's nest, like you don't even know what to eat there. But uh, nonetheless, I love you, Vin. Um, so yeah, okay. So that's I think that maybe that's really shed some light. I don't know which way I'll go with Beyond One if it has a huge practical component. A lot of people told me it's a great thing from a referral based side of things, like you're setting the stage really nicely. I know a lot of surgeons try and make things as easy or practical for their referring docs. Um, yeah, you're, hold... you're guaranteeing that they're using authentic components. That's one thing. That's it. That's and a I feel like from sure. a restorative standpoint, or from a referral based standpoint, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you give your trust to other people to finish the cases because I can't imagine. Um, but that's a whole other conversation. They... <laughs> even if they screw things up it's going to be so far away from the connection that it's not going to make that big of a deal yeah and again another piece like when you talk about practicality and i'm not the guy who cares i'm not a i'm not a a, a guy who nickels and dimes but i when i've discussed it with certain dentists and certain people and if i knew it had the advantage and i thought it was for sure i wouldn't even flinch at it but there's an added cost there. It is a little more expensive than a healing abutment. There's, there, I mean, there's all these little things that come sure. into practice integration realities that none of us want to talk about because they, yeah. you know, we all pretend we don't think about it, but the, some, but we do, right? So, um, anyways, okay. So I think I think it's certainly a worthy thing of consideration. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's work our way around the thing here. Let why don't we go to cement for screw retention because that is definitely in line with not disrupting the attachment that is so fickle. And I, I give, like I said, when, when I speak on this, I chander what Wani, Wani, and if people don't know who he is, he's kind of like the godfather of, you know, cement around implants or not in using the, cement around the implants. US. I mean, true. Cause that's very Thomas true. is really uh, the godfather of anti-cement, I think. And I agree because actually Chander uses Tom's research Thomas besides himself, himself. Yeah. When I first, yeah, when, when, I, when I first started looking into this as a topic, I was part of a big group that was putting on like a symposium kind of, and they said, you're going to talk about this. And that was like seven years ago, eight years ago. And I was like, what the hell am I going to talk about? And then they said, just watch this guy, watch this guy Chander. Anyways, so I often joke now when I've met him at various things, I said, like, listen, the first time I saw him, I said, I'm kind of like stealing your material. Like when I lecture, it's like everything is so much is your study, your pieces, your analogies. <laughs> And, and he's, same, you know, he's, a, same here. he's a, he's a character, right? So he was like, no problem because, you know, he's like Mr. Truth Teller. He's like, just spread the good word. Like, but it's, th that's an example of, again, I think a cyclical thing. Whereas, you know, when we used to ask people what you used, it was screw retention for a million years, a million years ago, then cement retention grew into favor. And I think a big piece of that was the Mish kind of movement. And that's where that came from. And then finally, Again, more recently, and by more recently, I mean really in the last, you know, eight to 10 years, let's call it, if we will, even that, you start to get, like when I pull people in the audience, now it's like the majority of people put up their hands saying they do, they do screw attention. But yeah. that was not, the, that wasn't the case when I first started asking that question some seven, eight years ago. A lot wow. of people use cement out of convenience. They were used to doing that on, a, on teeth on a daily basis. But again, we know. So, I mean, I think we're going to be uniform on this. Yeah. Here's my but, here's my opinion on the cyclic aspect of it. I think when it started off with implant dentistry, it was you had to be an oral surgeon to place implants, right? And then it was, okay, you can be an oral surgeon, you can be a periodontist. And yeah. then I think about 20 years ago, let's say late 90s-ish, when I would say more general dentists started getting into it, more prosthodontists started placing implants, et cetera. You had people that were used to like, I take crown, I put cement in crown, I put crown on. That's how I put and Chan crowns Chandra on. And Chandra, Chandra does a great job of describing that, right? There's a convenience form and there's pulls on it. H.P. Uh, Weber, who was like a, in Boston and a huge implant guy, he was primarily ITI, but um, he has a, there was like a pulled study. It was like, I think it's 2010 or something, but he, he shows that when he pulled dentists, they said just that. We do it out of convenience and, and everything and familiarity yeah. and share time and, and not uh, um, not out of uh, thinking that it's necessarily better on the indices and things like that, right? So I always I, I always relate stuff back to my dad and, and watches all of these. But my dad is like, like 
the average general dentist, right? Don't want to take it. He doesn't even have the torque wrench, you know, he does a few a month, right? So he just has the rep come in, give him the torque wrench. They're yep. there showing him how to do it. You know, the average referring doctor just wants to do what they, they always do. And that was, I think, cement started was having the yeah. restorative platform because at first you know the first 40 years was like look at this amazing thing i put these screws in the jaw just figure out how to put teeth on it right i'm amazing yeah. and then it got to be like well we kind of need to put teeth on this and these look okay so uh you know let's get the restorative doctor involved but i think a net aspect from the restorative doctors getting involved was i'll say us saying i just want to cement everything and then it took so many years right. to start doing research and noticing these trends to then have people like Shander and Thomas to start coming in and saying like, Hey guys, watch out. Yeah. Well, there's been this emergence and I think that that's a big reason of the reason I wanted to speak to you is because I think there was this historically division between surgeons thinking they were kind of here and the restorative docs were here for, for, for it. And there was this separation. And, you know, the, the surgeon had very little accountability. I was fortunate to be kind of ushered into this era of where there's this need to, to have some degree of knowledge. And that's why I really wanted to talk to you about all this, because I, I certainly don't put myself as the expert on the restorative side. You've asked me some questions or posed questions to me through DMs and stuff that I admittedly say I don't necessarily know the answer to. Right. I know where my kind of expertise end. But I appreciate that for my implant to have the best possible outcome, for me to have the good reputation, for patients to have word of mouth, et cetera, that I, I damn well better know what's happening on their end of things and that the, the buck doesn't just stop at me. It 100% the restorative people, I, I say that I'm just, I commonly say I'm, I'm not just trying to be like humble. I say I'm, I'm, the sur I'm just the surgeon. It's frankly, in a lot of cases, not that difficult to put implants in, but to do it properly is a whole different situation, right? So. Right. Um, yeah, you know, a problem with that, I would say from the restorative camp is so many restorative doctors are not trained enough on implants that they want the surgeon to come and say, tell me how to do this. What do you want me to do? I don't know what to do. And I think that is a, I don't know who we blame for that. I don't know if we blame dental schools. I don't know if we blame implant companies. I don't know who we blame, but you know, it's, it's almost like there should be a separation between implants and teeth in the profession in some sense, right? Um, yeah. You get out of and school you know, and you've, you've restored no, um, no implants, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're supposed to know how to do it. It's difficult. Yeah, and I, I'll tell you, I get a lot of people who come to me and after, because there are groups of people who did cement for years and then, and then they, and when they see someone talk about it and there's so much, as you know, overwhelming evidence that like when we talk about it, when Chandra talks about it, ev everyone walks out of that type of a lecture being like, I need to be doing screw retention. But I have a lot of people who come up to me and say, I mean, the common things I get is one is they say, well, listen, I've been working with this oral surgeon or this periodontist for years. And, uh, you know, I, I, a lot of times I have to do cement retention because the way the implant was placed or something, or, or how can I, 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 you know, it's the prosthetically driven factor. You have to, I say to them, you have to unfortunately have the hard conversation with your surgeon. If they don't know that you want it to be screw retained, you're giving them all the bandwidth in the world to put that implant wherever the fuck they want, because yeah. you've never told them this is an issue for me. And I'm getting, you know, concerns. And I saw this lecture. I saw this discussion. Like you have to tell them, unfortunately, I would like my preference is that I want everything to be screw retained if possible. I appreciate that there are circumstances anatomically, et cetera, where it may be challenging or difficult to require extra sure. armamentarium. But if they and, and they're scared to tell their surgeons that they've worked for for years about what to do because yeah. they don't want to have that tough conversation, which is means the patient gets caught in the crosshairs, right? So yeah, I think that you know me. Listen, I did my surgical residency, but you know, in general, I'm, I'm a restorative doctor, I would say, because sure. um, my, my residency that I did doesn't make, doesn't give me any, any certificate in the US. So Whatever. from the restorative camp, we are, we are um, intimidated by surgeons, right? And to, to come to a surgeon and say, and say it's like, terrible. you know, I want you to do it this way, um, puts us in a weird position, I think, because many restorative doctors don't have the knowledge, which is why they're, they're nervous about that. But I, that's why I, I really think that restorative doctors are 
need to know so much more about implants in order to restore them. Because Absolutely. when you think of like, going back to zero bone loss concepts, when you think about the surgical aspects of what the surgeon has to do, there's only a few, right? You have to make sure you have the good tissue thickness, if you place the Total implant placement. in the correct position, you have to select the correct implant design. There may be one thing I'm missing, but that's kind of it, right? I agree. I agree. After that, all of the things where you can screw it up is on the restorative doctors. And most restorative doctors don't have the knowledge of how to restore it properly with the biology and et cetera, et cetera. And even worse is that if we do screw it up, who do we blame? Right. I mean, it's your whole, implant, right? We blame the whole you finger placed pointing. it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, the, the whole thing is very difficult for sure. Um, and, and I, so, I mean, it's, I think it goes out saying your preference, if we had to pose the question, if you, in, in the super ideal world, would you place an implant using, would you like to restore it with cement or screw? Always I screw mean, for me. Yeah. I actually, stay with me. I, I think I've only done one or two cement. So every implant that I've I'm placed, every implant that yeah. I've placed in the last, I think it's four years now, all screw. Um, there's been one or two that have come in from other doctors or, you know, old implants that we have to redo that we don't have the components for or whatever that we've had to yeah. do cement. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I, and I, I guess that's, so people often talk about I, like the questions that I get, they say, well, you know, I, I use cement for convenience. I use cement perhaps out of, co out of cost, uh, different crazy things that, you know, shouldn't impact the true decision-making. Yeah. And then the, the other is, um, you know, you get this, this group of individuals who, uh, and I asked, I asked uh, Thomas to send me this as well, because it was in his live. Um, and, uh, you know, there's lots of tips and tricks for limiting the amount of cement that will extrude. And mm -hmm. one of the ones that I've seen all of them, I've seen people use retraction cords, it's a published article, it floats around. And I mean, oh my Breaking God, I remember the way I remember the way I used to pack retraction cords in dental school because I wanted to get the margin. I was like, literally, the patient was anesthetized. <laughs> it was at the bone level. Did. Literally. And we just had this whole discussion on trying to maintain attachment, right? So, you know, great, retraction cord. And the best part of that article is they show the retraction cord and then they fish it out and they show this huge amount of cement that's on it. And they're boasting, look how much cement this thing can get out. And it's like, honestly, like it looks like five millimeters of cement. So I'm thinking, okay, what happened? Did all of it come off on that or not? And like, yeah. can you see that deep down to know if it did or didn't? And, um, you, you know, so there's, there's that element. There's uh, another one, which I think actually makes sense, but I, I joke about abutment? it. The, which? Duplicate abutment? Yeah, exactly. So just make a little, anal make an analog or whatever with some blue mousse or registration. Yeah. Thomas actually there. Did, did research on that and shows that it doesn't, um, save all of the excess cement, actually. It's, you can still get excess and, cement if the margin is more than one millimeter subgingival. And he put so up it doesn't the thing fix that, it. That, that I was saying, which is great because like I, you, well, too bad because I often just try and seem at least I'm like a, not totally one-sided when I talk about I used it. to and say I showed, the same thing too. I, I show that one on is it. like, look, this is, if you're going to do it, use this. But he showed there was one with a rubber dam that he showed. And then he, he showed that, that it, was this, it was the case study and yeah. then he came in and it's then still said, goes well, subgingival. Exactly. And, and so mm -hmm. he did it on a run and I wanted that paper. I'd love to get that paper because, um, you know, it, it, it really is interesting. So the, the, really what it comes down to is I, I get that hand up every time of people saying, well, okay, fine, this is good and well, but what happens when I'm in that circumstance that right. they put the cement in and I, sorry, they, they place the implant too buck too facially and I can't have a screw access hole through the buckle. And I guess that can be a, not a full segue, but people are not aware of whether it's Nobel's Omni Grip or ASC abutment, or I think every company has. Yeah, I something think every company has one. Yeah. Like this now, but I mean, this to me, I am shocked at how few or the amount of people that don't know about it when I get when I speak on this topic, yeah. and and that like and and. They're like, well, I, cause I couldn't do it. You know, it, it offsets at like 20 or 25 degrees or something like yeah. this. Depending That's on the, like, the system. It's mm -hmm. a game changer. I mean, it's a game changer. It takes probably whatever percentage of the implants that had the two facial inclination. And it probably minimizes, maybe it doesn't get rid of all of them, but it certainly minimizes 
a huge portion of them. So I think that people yeah, need to be aware of that tool. There's positives and negatives to that too. One of the, the negatives is that the more you change it, the bigger your screw access hole is. So we have to think about it, like, especially on laterals. Um, yeah. If you're bringing it back 25 degrees, you're gonna have a giant screw access hole. Do you it have enough? Because it has to work its way around the curve, right? Like it's gotta go around the-, the Well, no, the no, it's because, you know, if this is the screw, you can hold it like this, like this, like this, like this, all the way around like this. Yeah. So it it's doesn't like a have to go around. I guess, yeah, the screw has to go around it. But um, like what I'll use it for sometimes in the anterior, let's say I place the implant guided surgery to where I can still do screw retain. But with that screw retention, I'm going to have a, a thin incisal edge still. I'll right. just move it back just so I have a thicker incisal edge. So more right. like long-term stability on a, from a material standpoint we started to kind of restore all of ours with a like what like with ascs was what we basically mm -hmm. started doing um, one of the nice things is you have a titanium insert so you have a titanium yeah. titanium connection and then you have zirconia abutment on top so you have good material subgingivally no matter what you use yeah and uh, i mean listen I, I i know that there's still going to be these people that are kind of hard uh hardcore cementers um which is, you know, a bit of a shame because it, they should all look at the, um, some of the classic literature that talks about the percentages of, you know, the, oh, yeah. this being, and they're like Tom, Tom Wilson, right? I mean, is like the classic, classic. 81%. Uh, yeah, 81%. Exactly. I have and that then what you, it, it, Excess cement is what, seen it, in 81% of the cases with peri implant disease. And the better conclusion is kind of like Cox postulates of like removing a stimulus and getting a change when he goes using that endoscope and actually physically removes where he can see the cement nearly 76% or 73% or something Recover. actually return to health. Right. So yep. it's like, uh, I mean, that's, that's like the main I have some cases like that. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, and it's, it's so it's a, it's, it's a tough one, but, uh, and you don't jump to that right away. And then people argue with you, couldn't, shouldn't you be able to see it on the radiograph? And the answer is no, because it's, even if it's not, it may not be radio opaque, or even if it yeah, is, it has to be approximately, right? I mean, so it, go, it kind of goes yeah. on and on, but yeah, yeah. I mean, so for people who are doing uh, cement retained, there's lots of options out there. You should try not to, if possible, it would be, I think our kind of take home. Where are we at in this yeah. topic list here that we have or haven't? Well, done, we've, uh, we've talked about ASC. We've talked about stay in abutments. We've talked about screw retention. We've talked about hygiene. I think we could go to subcrestal placement. Do subcrestal and then we'll end off on, I want to I hear your thoughts. I don't think you guys even have it in the States, but we can talk about surfacing in general subgingivally. That's what that little histological image. That one comes from Nobel. It's, you could, uh, okay. you know, the, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you my thoughts i've had the, i don't think you guys have it in you in the u.s yet do we you? don't have zeal yet no yeah do you have tie ultra or just neither no like, we don't they're, have they're different I mean, yeah. yeah so anyways okay so let's go with subcrestal placement because this for me and this is going to be your your big thing but for me i again not necessarily based on on studies not knowing it something i was just doing i it was for emergence it made sense to me it was, it, I just always placed my implants a little bit deeper. Maybe I felt better about it. If there was going to be bone loss. I didn't know what it was biologically. And I appreciate there's an establishment of a biologic width, but, um, and I like, uh, I know we keep saying his name. I apologize, Thomas, who I've never actually met. I know you're close to him. That's why I'm, oh, you got him. He's him. such a great guy. Yeah. But he talks about, you know, bone loss versus remodeling. Right. And I like that yeah. differenti differentiation, which again, so many people blanket it, but, um, so anyway, so yeah, you tell me, give me the science behind subcrestal placement, because okay. it's something that, again, I do. And I, I use those, pro, those profilers all the time, because I don't usually do two stage, but people say, how can I place it subcrestally? Because then I can't seat my components and things. You have to have the armamentarium. You go, I use those profilers like wildfire. That's another instrument people don't know about. It's you know? true. It's, it's yeah. definitely something people don't know about. So my subcrestal um, journey, I guess, started with working with Sasha Devonovic. So Sasha and I practiced together for many years, nine years, I think, um, teach together a lot, do a lot of courses together and, and treat patients together. And he was always telling me, you need to have three to four millimeters 
from your implant neck to your I ideal gingival margin zenith. 100%. And oftentimes what I would see is that means that I have to be subcrestal. And you'd say, okay, then in that case, you have to be subcrestal. Now he didn't necessarily explain it to me, you know, at that point early in my career, it was just, this is Sasha Jovanovic, my mentor, whatever you say goes, right? And I, I we didn't don't, ask too, you don't, I didn't you ask don't know questions. what you don't know. It's yeah. told you don't know what you don't know. You just say yes, right? You <laughs> yeah. And so I was always doing that because how it worked with Sasha and I early on was I was doing all the guided surgery. So I would plan all the cases, show it to him, you know, print him a guide and say, here you go. And just kind of hand it off to him. And then he would drill it and I would restore it. Um, so I started doing subcrestal a long time ago. I didn't really know why. It was just, that's what Sasha told me to do. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at the research behind it, I think the first thing we have to think about is um, Thomas's article about tissue thickness. So okay. showing that thin tissue, that's two millimeters or below, um, over one year lost 1.17 millimeters of bone. Anything above that, so thick tissue, over one year, 0 0.2. So 1.1 millimeters to 0 0.2 millimeters over the first year of bone loss. Yeah. Strictly based on tissue thickness. So randomized clinical trial with the same inclusion, exclusion criteria, very, very well two, done. Two stage on, are those all two stage implants? Um, that's a good question. You know? yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I, don't I mean, I guess it technically so. doesn't matter. Once you open it, then you put the Once big you one open anyways. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, another, another interesting study. Um, where is that? Talking about taking, oh, here we go. Here we go. This is Tomasi, 2013. They That's, took muco yeah. mucosal biopsies at eight weeks of i don't i don't have the amount of implants 20, 21 humans okay take mucosal biopsies at eight weeks and figure out what was the tissue thickness and the average was 3.6 millimeters there's some other studies that show another one that showed 3.6 with 70 implants 35 patients another one that showed 3.9 average that was on dogs so take that into account but we're getting up to the point of where we're, we're at least 3.5 in tissue thickness that's needed. So there's a few ways to maintain this. If we know that we have to have thick tissue to have good bone stable, a good stable bone over time, we can either grow tissue up or grow tissue down. And what grow tissue down means is place your implant subcrestal if it's a platform switched implant and your body will elongate your tissue. Mm -hmm. Basically, it will remove bone to make tissue um, yep. to have to maintain that biology. Without, that's without doing any soft tissue augmentation, correct? Uh, or, you, when you place it subcrestal. Correct. Yes. Yep. Yeah, so what, what I find is that many implants are placed too shallow based on two factors. One is tissue thickness. So, you know, they have one millimeter and they place it to the bone. Yep. Or based on aesthetics. So many times we see in the posterior region, you have like premolar like this, second premolar like this, first molar flat. Yep. The old because table. The old they table just, top. Yeah, because they opened it and placed it to the, to the bone crest. Yep, I agree. And molars, one of the things that becomes challenging with molars is obviously anatomically, we're in a different situation, both from the, the nerve and the sinus standpoint. So right. sometimes we're not in a situation where if you're already like an eight millimeter implant or something like this, it can be, it can be more challenging, right? I mean, you, you can't drop it down um, because of fear of, of anatomical interferences. But yeah, well, this, may be, this may be one of the reasons why you want to place it at the crest and thicken the tissue instead. 100%. Sometimes in that case, yeah. sometimes in that case, you may get like better biology, long-term stability, but less aesthetics. So we have yep. to think about what are we, you know, if it's a second molar, who gives a shit about the aesthetics, right? We want long-term stability that patients want yep. to chew. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. And for the cases where you're building tissue up, uh, yep. I love, I really like that division that you, mm -hmm. that analogy, that's a really good way to envision it. Um, for where you're building tissue up, um, 
I know that uh, there's different discussions on this. Are you consistently using, I know you're surgical, but you may not be mm -hmm. full out, but are, are you using autogenous or are you using various allografts? I think we discussed FibroGuide, um, yeah. uh, Alloderm, different things like that. Is, yeah. Are you just plunking those in on, a, a, like on every implant that has thin tissue, you're using something like that? Are you using auto, are you using allo, and which, which items? So very rarely am I thickening tissue because most of the time I play subcrustal. If I, if I really need to thicken tissue, and let's say posterior, I'm yeah. oftentimes using FibroGuide from Guy Slick. Sure. Anterior, usually when I go to kind of the Inyaki Gambarina way of thinking with um, dense tuberosity. tuberosity, if it's there, or retromolar pad, or uh, yeah. free gingival graft. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So let me just show you this diagram because this is a diagram I made when I was going through the process of trying to understand this. And maybe I should turn off my light real quick so you can see. Yeah, I'm getting that. a little reflection there. Um, okay. So we've got two implants. One is placed subcrestal. One is placed crestal. This is yep. a thin, thin. Uh, can you guys see it? I can see this it. This is sort a of thin thinning. tissue. Hold on. You know what I should do is do this. There we go. Okay, oh, so this is thin, thin tissue biotype, okay? Yep. What's going to happen in this case is the body wants to make that, let's say, 3.5 to 4 millimeters of Absolutely. biologic width. It wants to protect itself from the bacteria in the mouth. You got it. So over time, this is what's going to happen. And what I say is you're going to lose bone anyways. Would you rather lose it above your implant or on your implant? Yeah, I'll I'm gonna be uh, I'm gonna be stealing that that slide. Yeah, um, I can send it to you. That's a good. One. And then, yeah, you know, this is more of the muco integration aspect of if you had muco integration on this, oftentimes the um, bone loss will stop here because you have a seal here. Yeah. The bacteria won't get past that adher adherent zone. If you don't have a seal there, what you're gonna have is bacteria attached to the implant neck. And then it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. And it's, it, oops, it's going to turn into those, you know, the ones you have to extract ultimately. Yeah, I agree. Okay. That's so great. then let's, that's great. Let's do another one. Now here we have thick tissue on one side, thin tissue on the other side, both placed at the crest. What's going to happen here is that you're going to get a slight bit of remodeling on the one over here. And you're going to get bone loss on this one. Because it has the buffer of the tissue already. Yeah. Yeah, because the, bo the body's going to make the biologic width whether you want it to or not. Yeah, I know. People don't seem to get in. You get people, um, and sorry to interrupt, but you get people saying, oh, well, I use a platform switch implant, right? Well, guess what? <laughs> platform switch is wonderful. You sh again, this is, goes back to the use as many things in your, in your toolbox that will limit this. But, you know, I, I, I've kind of did, done a little bit of reading during this time, not as much as I would like, but I was reading the, the pink Bible from Herzler and Zur. And at w one point they talk about platform switch and they actually say, listen, you know, this, I knew this already, but just to see it there in writing from them, they say, although platform switch is shown by many different studies and doctors and industry to minimize or allow for greater bone stability, tissue stability, there's plenty of evidence showing that's not always the case. And I well, think Thomas did a study on this specifically. Yeah. Um, and, and, and basically proved this, that um, it doesn't matter if it's platform switched or not. If you don't have vertical tissue thickness, right. you'll lose bone. Yeah. If your implants place the crust. Yeah. Yeah. So how, how we have to get this across to the surgical and the restorative community is that the body wants to protect itself from the bacteria in the mouth. So it needs a certain like jacket thickness, right? It's, yeah. it's so dirty. It needs a certain thickness of jacket to protect itself. If you don't have it, it's going to get that jacket thickness. It's just going to be at the cost of the bone. At the yeah. cost. And you know, it's funny that you, I, and I, I describe it in a similar way because normally when I ask people what biologic width is, you know, the, the, the thing that everyone shoots up their hand, they're all so quick to say, oh, three millimeters is the definition of biologic width. 
because that's like implants the, are not teeth. Yeah, me memorize the teeth. But you know, it's it, but it's even so. Or, or they'll, let's say they call it three or four, whatever it is. But if you actually ask them to tell you what biological it is to explain it, they they, they may mention the like the two or the three things depending on if you want to include um, the like the the marginal portion, the sulcus, but most of them will not be able to explain it. And I always give the explanation similar to what you said, which is that the, if you were to denude the gums or remove, which they used to do a million years ago in perio, but literally cut the gums off to the level of the crest of bone, the, gum, the, the bone always wants to regrow about three millimeters of, of gum on top of it to protect itself, right? So yeah. it, it's exactly what you said. So people, I think, because there's, there's a lot of, and actually the word biologic width, I don't know if you know this, it was, the definition was changed that same thing, the EFP and the AAP, they changed the term biologic width, which I actually think is one of the best changes to supra crestal attachment. That is literally ah, what it is. I right? like that. So, I'm writing that down. So it's like, that's like when they changed that, of all the people, people were criticizing all these changes, I said, that is literally what it is. It's the attachment above the bone. Like it's like. Supra crestal yeah. attachment. Um, someone's this. asking, so Dr. Walton, please talk also about profilers to place the implant subgingivally. Um, oh, Ehab's in the house. He's, he's good. Um, so uh, with regard to the profilers, it, every, most companies have them now. I certainly know that Strawman and Nobel have them. I didn't know it existed. It's a little item that uh, it basically you put on the equivalent of almost similar to like a healing abutment. That's like a straight uh, thing. And um, I, can, I can actually, I can, sh I can show something here. Um, yeah, this, this, the profiler brings up a good point. And this was something that, that Thomas shows a lot is oftentimes if you're placing implants subcrestally, we have bone over the implant or around the implant. Yes. And if, if you're just jamming your restorative components onto there, oh, no, it's yeah. unpredictable what is going to happen with the bone. So a predictable way to do it. And what he says is remove the bone to save the bone is doing this profiling so making space for the prosthetic component so you're not going to put so much pressure and i think what we need to remember is that in between the bone is the tissue the tissue is filled with blood if we s just squeeze the hell out of the tissue the it's blood goes away we have yep. necrosis and the body's going to make that biologic width again so it's going to just kind of go crazy and say well i need the tissue so i don't care about you bone and it's going to go away from that yeah. So what, so you use, yes, you, you know, you, you don't use it after the final drill. So you drill, you actually put it on the healing abutment. You, so you put it once the, you place your implant. So you place your implant, then you screw this little uh, thing on that looks like a, essentially like a straight healing abutment that has no taper. And then it's, this thing almost looks like a tref line for lack of a better explanation yeah. that goes just it's around end cutting this. Burr healing about mm -hmm. it and it comes in a straight and in a flared form and for me 100 percent um here i'll show I, I i've got the image here i'll just show it quickly um i'm big on the uh the flare um i don't know if this will or won't show up there we go yeah so this is this is what this thing looks like here i'm gonna turn so comments off so people can see this yeah you put on this which is the healing abutment portion and you use this which is the profiler and here it is running. So we use it a lot for all on four because the distal implants are angulated. Yeah. And so if you place it even crestal, the distal portion of the implant it will so actually- far subcrestal. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So anyways, that's, uh, that's kind of that. But um, it's, it's, again, one that for whatever reason, people just don't know about. I don't know why that is the case, but it's just a lesser used kind of thing that is- um, is, uh, is, is a key one, I find. Yeah, yeah, you remove the bone to save the bone. And when you remove the bone, so this brings up another point about all in four, when you remove the bone, you make space for that to fill in with, with blood. And oftentimes you get good tissue there. Yeah. And this, I think, is one of the reasons why all on four, t kind of taking into account everything we've talked about, this is one of the reasons why I think all on four type of implant treatment is so successful because when you think about it you have one abutment one time you remove the bone to save the bone so you yeah. have good tissue thickness you have screw retention it's so many of the factors that we've already talked about yeah this dr flossen great point same principle behind traditional crown lengthening 100 if you 
if you put the margin in a bad place, the body's gonna do the bone loss for you, right? Oh, it's goth totally kid. true. Kyle, mm -hmm. do you know goth? Do you know goth too? No, you, I don't think so. You, you, you guys should be connected. He's, he's, he's our big cosmetic guy in Toronto. He's awesome. Um, he's a prosthodontist, but it, follow him. His work's incredible, but he's really good. Um, bone remodeling, guys, not bone loss. Yeah, that's a good distinction that we should we should talk about. So bone remodeling, what Thomas says is above the implant neck. Yeah. And bone loss is below the implant neck. And I think that's a good distinction because oftentimes we talk like, oh, well, you had bone loss on that case. But no, it didn't go below the implant neck. So that's a good distinction to talk it's about. It's like this. It's like this, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Because cause the, cause the bone, for the most part, will go toward the collar of the implant. And we know that a lot of the times it's actually determined by the, the, the adjacent teeth, which will kind of, you know, anchor it or hold it. But it will, you'll see commonly that diagonal, even in a well-placed implant that's healthy, it's not bone loss. It's just that the bone that's being held in place for the interproximal area it, because the cementum and the CJ and everything else and the stronger attachment is at that point. And then you put the implant subcrestally and so to allow for the emergence and it goes down to the neck of the implant, right? Yeah, and I should be uh, particular about, um, about su subcrestal placement. And if you're gonna do subcrestal placement, you have to have the correct implant design. Yeah. And I think that's something, not every implant can be placed subcrestal. If you have a flat to flat connection, you don't have platform switching, conical connection type of implant, you really shouldn't be placing it subcrestal. And so yeah. understanding the implant design is one of the first things that I think people don't understand, right? Oftentimes like, well, my rep said I can do whatever I want with this, right? Yeah, I mean, people want that blanket solution. They want that easy solution. That's yes. definitely the case. Which is why I think that the, the bigger blanket solution is to use a conical connection platform switched implant because then you have more flexibility. Yep, for sure. I, I don't I'm see a you. reason on using a flat to flat connection implant now unless you just have a gigantic warehouse that you bought years ago and you have to use it up. But other no, than that, your, your hands are tied behind your back on where you can place the implant and not lose bone. Yeah. Um, you want to, I guess we've pretty much done everything, but like, I guess we could call it technologies or surfacing or things like that. You want to just kind of pull it, finish up on that? Sure. Yeah, you want to start? So, yeah, sure. So, I mean, I know, listen, there's there's lots of different things out there from different manufacturers, from different companies. Um, you know, everyone says that their thing is the best. I agree. Conical connection is a, is a good starting point. There's so much that they put into the way platform shift, conical connection. I mean, we the, the list goes on. Um, from a surfacing standpoint, um, I know that uh, the, the, so Nobel has this thing for people who hasn't seen who haven't seen it uh, called uh, Zeal or Thai Ultra, and I'll I'll just put up quickly. Uh, I'll show it, the image here just so people can kind of see. Um, okay. He's awake from his nap. <laughs> Daddy, come. Okay, guys. All right. So um, there. So this is this is kind of their their thing that they're showing, and the whole idea here is this this surfacing that is that is different. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, it's not available in the U.S., but it's uh, available in Canada. And the idea is just to clarify, Thai Ultra is the new surface itself along here. And Zeal is just on, only comes on the on one and on multi units, meaning abutments that stay in and don't come out. Yeah. And the idea is that this is, this is, at, this is super uh, friendly to the, hip, to, the uh, to the soft tissues. And this, and this is interesting, is that it's, it's more rough down at the pecs where you want it for integration. And as it works its way up, it doesn't become truly smooth, but this part that looks gold in its appearance, just anodized, is actually, you know, and where they're getting crit criticism from is that it's hopefully will maintain bone because it's smoother. But if you do lose bone, then it's a more maintainable surface. Then, of course, a lot of people are like, oh, why, why are you worried about losing bone in the first place? But, right. I, I mean, it, it lends itself to this sort of imagery, which is this really nice histology they have where they talk about that they're getting a very good um, like epithelial um, type of attachment 
or adherence really high affinity to this type of structure, which I mean, for me, I think is important. So that I've been placing them. I've used, uh, I've, I haven't exclusively switched to that implant, but I'm using a lot of it. And I can't say that I've seen like a dramatic, um, uh, like a crazy, amazing, um, you know, like outcome, but I, I'm, I'm always curious. And because I'm always trying to take on things that are going to better my practice or, or improve outcomes, I don't have enough. I, I don't have anything that's stark at this point, but that's, that's the, that's the extent of my experience. But I do like that. They're, they're trying, you know, people always say, well, why, why they're old ones. They're old guys get out of here, you little rodents. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, I, I always say that, uh, I think it's nice to see them improving. I don't view that as a lot of people have criticized them as it's like, oh, you recognize there's a problem and there's a weakness and that's why you're doing it. Well, it's like, well, how does anyone improve upon anything? I mean, I don't know. It's that's the same true. with Strom Strawman has SL, uh, SLA, SL yeah, active. SLA and SL active and people don't even know that they only have the, act like most people just think they only have the active. Well, no, it's not the case, right? So I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I don't know if I'm sold on these, on these uh, surfaces, you know, the research yeah. that I've read has all said it's comparable. I was just, I, w I wasn't looking at you, but I was listening, but I was bringing up some of, some of the research on it that basically just says like, it's comparable with other materials. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, yes. For me, the reason was why I, yeah. the reason why I would use one is because it's yellow. <laughs> yeah. they, 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 honestly they, they, they a look it. cool and b from a tissue standpoint of show through like it could be better than the gray yeah i mean yeah 100 percent. it's like it's like it's the same thing with with implant surfaces i think once we realize that like if we put a rough implant surface almost every implant integrates right we're not yep. worried about integration anymore it's almost a guarantee. It's very close to being a guarantee, right? Unless maybe we're over we're overloading during during integration. But sure. I mean, very rarely. Like I don't use anything to verify osseo integration. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I shouldn't say that we do. We don't use it as properly as we should. Like we have osteo in our practice. Yeah, but we have a habit. We used to use of that in my residency all the time, right? Oh my gosh, did it integrate? And yeah. now it's like, if I take the healing abutment off and the implant didn't come out, it integrated. <laughs> I, I, I'm with you. I, a lot of people are into reverse torquing and things. I guess this is all terrible ideas because- I think reverse I, torque, especially I, in the maxilla, I've removed, is not a great idea. I've removed idea. too many implants in my day for like prosthetic reasons to know that yeah. you could take an implant that looks like it has perfect bone levels and perfectly integrated for 20 years. And sometimes yeah. you can just take it out by doing this. So yeah. it's like, why do you want, there's obviously different levels of integration and that's why there's different levels of ISQ measures. And that's why yeah. there's people that are low ISQers and higher ISQers. And you can't necessarily say that an implant's not ready to be loaded because they're a 48 ISQ. We get yeah. people riding on a 48 ISQ for years. So yeah, um, yeah I'm with you on that. It, again, just one more place we seem to share similar sentiments. So I think some of these surfaces too, and this comes from, it comes from every system, right? Every system wants to say they're better than the other system. For sure. To me, it's the implant design, the, like macro design, and it is the restorative components. Most yeah. implants that you place in the bone are going to integrate. But you have to put a tooth on it, and that can be very difficult in some cases. Some big systems, I did one a few months ago, don't have tie bases still, which is wild. Some you know, don't have zirconia abutments still, which is crazy. Like Some don't have angle screw channel. Uh, most do now, but yeah. a few years ago, not a lot did. So to me, it more comes down with that. What is the restorative flexibility like? How can you put a tooth on it and make it look good and not have to struggle through the process? So, you know, I hear the same thing, like, um, like people that use this new Nobel surface may say like, oh, well now I can load implants faster. And they, they do that all the time with Strawman too. Well, I use SLA or I use SLA. I can load implants in six weeks. You could load any implant in six weeks. It's they, not, they, they, it they doesn't make the long, body faster. They, they have the long, well, they have longer, they have good research, which is what they hung their hat on for a million years. But the thing that I was laughing at to all of that, because you know that I kind of place and 
do business with both Strongman and Nobel. Which I think that, is great that you do, by the way. It makes yeah, you not like I'm, a, I'm, um, I'm a trying commercial to, for anybody. I'm trying yeah. to ride that as long as they'll let me. Um, because I do like that. And that's always in my discussion with both the companies. They should respect it, that. Yeah. It brings more merit to it because I use both and they're both great and they both have their yeah. indications and they, and they both work well and I'm not in the bank of either of them, right? So, um, but, uh, you know, we load our implants day one, all of our implants. So it's like, well, what are you telling me that you can load the implant in six weeks? Like, or right. eight weeks? I was like, we're immediately loading everything. Like most 95 are where we first placed. So I was like, I yeah. know that these implants surface or whatever surface, uh, you know, um, tie unite, et cetera, whatever it was, it, we can, we can do it. And I think the last piece you said that you think it, that most integrate and that you want to make sure that they have good restorative components. The last piece that I think is important that people maybe don't want to, it's like, not, I don't know if it's faux pas to say, but you know what? I was watching uh, like a YouTube, it was a, of um, uh, um, uh, uh, Hertzler was giving like a, a, he gave, they gave some really great webinars. I've watched them. They're really great. And he said, you know, one of the things that he admitted to the company that was sponsoring what he did, and he just said, the best implant company for you is the one that like you work with the best, not only surgically, but also from like a customer service standpoint. Like there's a lot to be said for having relationships with these reps and them being there for you and exchanging product when you need it. And you know, all these other things that people think are like, Oh, that sounds like BS, but it, it means so much. And I know that many of my reps have been on this and like territory people, but like I have intricate relationships with them and they're, they're very supportive of what I do and they help me professionally and they help me with patients and they've gotten me out of situations. And, you know, that's, that's a huge piece as well. Plus they're all on the bigger end of the spectrum where if people are in other countries or down the road, I'm not worried about componentry and changes yeah. and going out of business and these crazy things where patients show up on our, our doorstep and I don't know what brand it is or, you know, can we remove it? Do we have a piece? Can it be attached? <laughs> so many so, cases like that. A I just came from France and I placed it 30 years ago. The doctor's out of, out of business and he doesn't right. have anything. So, I mean, it's, it's, there's something to be said for that. And they warranty their implants and they will give them to you, they give you for free if they fail. I mean, there, there's, there's a lot to be said for that. It's like, yeah. uh, right. So I think that's another piece of how we decide to use certain implants. Cause I think a lot of people say, what, why now I get asked all the time, why do you strom in this for this and Nobel mm -hmm. for that and whatever. I mean, there's a lot that goes both, you know, in front of the, the camera or the phone and, what happens behind it. Yeah, well, that comes back to the point of like, we have to run a business, you know? And if it makes you run your business better. Of course. Because, you know, that's how Implant Direct built a however many hundreds of million dollar business is sure. we're going to take away all the reps and we're going to bring the prices down because of that, because we don't have to pay reps. Yeah, listen, and Jerry, I think it was Jerry a great was a model yeah. because there were a lot of people that were like, I don't want to put pay a premium cost because I don't need a, I don't need a rep. You know, I do, yeah. I do one implant a month, two implants a month. I granted, order granted what I need. Granted, probably need the rep the most, but. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. I, I order one <laughs> implant that I need and, you know, I don't need, and maybe it works for these people. And I actually used to use um, Implant Direct when I, when I got out of school because of yeah. one of the, one of the companies, one of the offices that I worked for. I have And again, it's like the implants were fine. Restorative components at the time were lacking. I don't know what they are now. I haven't used them for years. Yeah. Or no, that's not true. I, I, I did a case a few years ago, actually. That's kind of a crazy case. I, I should show you that case. But um, yeah, I think, again, every implant can work. But you have to know how to understand that and make it work. And then you have to analyze it on the restorative side. And then again, have... Um, have someone that will save your ass if you drop an implant on the ground and your patient flies in from another state, you know? Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So what have we not covered or should we, should we end it? Do we have any other comments? Someone was asking about what about the alloy titanium grades rock solid, for example, what, what is your thought on that? I mean, rock solid's good. All the implants that I use from Strauman now are rock solid. That, was like a long time ago kind of thing. Um, the, uh, like I, the rock solid first cut my kind of ear or eye when I was in my residency and I did my residency in Boston, 
it's a very strawman territory because the the plant, the American plant, is in Andover, which is we just, have two minutes remaining, by the way. Yeah. So, anyways, basically, long and short, they were the first people to show with the rock solid that you could use their three point three millimeter implant versus a four millimeter implant in premolar and canine sites and stuff like that. So that was a big and narrow implants is a whole other discussion of why I'm pro. So rock solid kind of showed that again, many implants can do it. Okay, good. I'm actually going to be working on, um, I, I have a planned study that I'm working on to uh, look at different alloys of implants in a randomized clinical trial and see if we get a difference. So we'll see, I guess on that. Um, cool. I think this went well. We talked about a lot of stuff. Like I, I said, self -ser self-serving. I got what I wanted out of it, for sure. There, there's going to be a lot of people that are really pissed off about a lot of things we talked about, I think. So, you schooled um, me, so it's great. We'll probably get a lot of DMs, <laughs> people that hate us. Good. So, But I think if we don't offend a few people, then what's the point, right? Oh, hey, hey Cyril. I know that we're taking off, and Glover. I know the other guys. All right, so Kyle, you and I will end up talking after this. I got some thoughts in my head about where to go from here with some stuff as well. But anyways, it was a pleasure as always, buddy. Be safe. Yeah, super stay cool. healthy. Okay. All right, guys. Bye, everybody. Ciao. All right.